We all have come to accept and maybe love the disturbing creatures of Fallout, but have you ever wondered how they came to be? And no, I don't just mean radiation. I'm talking about the scientific and in-game lore reasons on how these creatures have evolved. Take for example the gigantic bugs in Fallout. At first you think there's not very much to them, they are just bugs that are super big, but a lot more goes into their explanation than that. Believe it or not, over 300 million years ago, gigantic insects really did roam the Earth. This was called the Carboniferous and Permian Era. During this time, the chemical makeup of the Earth's atmosphere was at an all-time high of 35% oxygen, which is extremely large in comparison to today's 21%. This is an important bit of information because insects breathe differently. Instead of having lungs, they have a bunch of holes in their abdomen called tracheae. Because the way insects breathe is less efficient than having lungs, the size of how large an insect can be is limited by the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So what this possibly implies is that the world of Fallout has a much higher oxygen saturation than the world we know today, which would be the only reason why insect gigantism would be possible. I would assume that the sudden decrease in the use of fossil fuels and the lack of deforestation would contribute to the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere. We've only ever seen the effects of the war on the continental United States. There could be other parts of the world where bombs did not hit, but are still affected by intense radiation. Maybe places like the Amazonian rainforest were left okay. There is also the fact that plants are more resistant to radiation than most animals, at least according to some research done on plants that survived at Chernobyl, meaning that the animals that create CO2 have mostly died off, while the plants that create oxygen have survived at a higher rate. But Mari, how could insects evolve so quickly? It's only been about 200 years. Well, one explanation is simple sci-fi radiation effects. The real world explanation is that baby insects need to grow very quickly in oxygen dense atmospheres or they die of oxygen poisoning. Too much of a good thing can kill you. So only the baby insects that grew the biggest survived. Since insect generation cycles are pretty fast, meaning their lifespans are short and they breed quickly, Changes in the species would not take an incredible amount of time. 200 years is still pretty fast though. And because of the lower amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, the climate of the world would be colder. And a colder atmosphere also contributes to gigantism in the aquatic animal kingdom, explaining why mirelurks are so huge. Larger aquatic animals are much better suited at surviving cold water than small ones, which is why animals in cold water are usually much bigger than their warm water cousins. Additionally, scientists believe that lobsters never die of old age, but simply grow bigger forever, which means the only thing that stops a lobster from living forever and becoming ungodly huge is simply not being eaten. So let's say those mirelurks you've been killing through the wasteland have been irradiated and grow a bit faster than usual, and they are also somehow related to the lobsters we know in our world. They could easily have been 200 year old creatures that you just massacred. Is this particular point a bit of a stretch? Kinda. But is it cool to think that something is an immortal water being that only grows bigger? Yes. There is also the forced evolutionary virus, which is canonically known for creating many of the fallout creatures. The forced evolutionary virus, otherwise known as the FEV, can only explain some of the more unnatural creatures of fallout, like the centaurs or super mutants, but it also has a very high chance for sterility, and most of the time infected subjects are a result of intentional exposure, making it highly unlikely to be the sole culprit for the majority of fallout creatures. The FEV works in a similar fashion to today's genetic therapy via viruses. Normal wild viruses work by injecting their genetic material into the host cells, thus forcing that cell to become a factory to create more copies of that virus. For genetic therapy with the use of viruses, the same idea is used but these viruses inject useful genetic material that will tell the cells to do something good for your body. For example, create more insulin for diabetics so that they have to inject less. The FEV is special in that most viruses can only infect a host cell once before it is destroyed, while the FEV can infect cells infinitely. The FEV is also not exactly beneficial, as it can turn you into something gross like this. That used to be a human. It wasn't born that way. Someone exposed a human to the FEV with the centaur code in it and made them that way. Well, there were also some other animals thrown into the mix, but the overall idea is that what you see used to be a human and had to go through the changes to become that. 
They very much could still be in there, silently screaming. Another creature affected by the FEV virus are the Death Claws. They were created by mixing up a bunch of animals, but mostly from the Jackson's Chameleon, explaining their ability to go invisible. Despite what many people think, if given the chance, a Deathclaw will be kind and gentle. It's the world that has made them fearful and attack on sight. I know, I know, it's hard to believe these big baddies are actually peaceful, but I can prove it. If you give the Deathclaw eggs back to their nest in Fallout 4, the Deathclaw in the area will never attack you, going so far as to even come up to you and greet you if you come visit her. Additionally, in a previous Fallout game, intelligent Deathclaws went against their human master's orders and set up a peaceful community for themselves and other humans. It worked out well until the whole settlement was destroyed by, you guessed it, their former human masters. Proving that the Deathclaw is actually a peaceful animal if you prove yourself to not be a threat. Just like any other animal or human in Fallout, they are just trying to survive and defend themselves. They just happen to be really strong and powerful. In a less disturbing and sad direction, let's cover why some of the natural mammals in Fallout have polycephaly, which means having more than one head or having extra limbs. The Brahmin and the Radstag both have polycephaly. Usually animals that have polycephaly are a result of inbreeding and are actually identical twins that did not fully separate in the womb. These cases are extremely rare and often result in premature death. In case you don't know, identical twins are a result of one zygote splitting into two. This split can occur at several stages of development inside the womb. Sometimes this split is not completed and you end up with one baby with polycephaly. This phenomenon happens in many different species, but because the occurrence of twins is affected by rare inherited genetics, this is still rare. So how did it come to be that such a rare occurrence became the species norm? Well, my best guess would be natural selection. But how could a condition that results in a high mortality rate become the thing that survived? Well, what if polycephaly is linked to a few inherited genetic abnormalities? If these genetic abnormalities were also linked to a few other traits, let's say a resistance to radiation, aka a higher radio resistance, then the animals with two heads ended up surviving more than the animals with only one head. So the two-headed animals had more offspring until the entire species was just partially split twins. But how can two heads make you more resistant to radiation? Well, the exact way it possibly would work is that if a certain gene made you release more or less of a certain type of protein. Let's say that protein had two effects on your body. One effect was that you were much more likely to become a twin in utero that does not fully split into two people, but the second effect that protein had was to also give you a slightly higher tolerance to radiation, meaning you would survive the radiated wasteland easier, and your children would also have a chance of having two heads and a resistance to radiation. The more children you have and the more your one-headed friends die, the more of the species becomes two-headed with a resistance to radiation. Since cows and deer seem to be somewhat kind of related a little bit? Maybe both species share that same rare genetic attribute, and both happen to survive the wasteland as a species that way. So all those animals that are born with two heads now and die would actually flourish in a radioactive wasteland where all the other predators and competitors die from radiation, leaving just the two-headed animals with very little competition to survive. I hope I explained that well. One last thing I would like to point out is that it seems that domestic cats have become more common in the timeline of Fallout. Cats were once believed to be extinct by many areas because they were mostly hunted and eaten for food after the war. However, during the events of Fallout 4, I have come across many cats that seem to be well fed and not afraid of humans, meaning that no one seems to want to kill them for food and are being taken care of for companionship. This may seem like a small detail, but it implies a lot. Companion animals are a huge luxury. The people of the Commonwealth no longer need to hunt cats for small amounts of food, and they also have enough food to spare on a companion animal. This implies that the world of Fallout is heading in a direction that is finally, maybe, recovering from the Great War in a meaningful way.